Wow! How's it going guys? Welcome to The Secret History, Living in Your Aquarium. If you've been watching lately, I have been doing a lot of work with vivarium, riparium type uh, creations, as it were, and using different bottles, vases, jars, and containers to actually plant... Uh, typically these plants would be considered uh, aquarium plants, uh, aquatic plants, but they are not strictly aquatic in that you can plant them underwater in aqua soil. This is like a, a Fluval or EcoComplete type brand. This one's ADA Amazonia by Aqua Design Amano. And it is their uh, Amazonia soil light or version two, whatever you want to call it. And I have put this into bowls and then uh, drainage for rocks and then we have the uh, plants. Well, the cool thing about these teeny little enclosures is there is actually a fish in North America that is small enough and hardy enough and just cool enough to want to keep in this small of a little container. You obviously, ideally, if, if you haven't done this before, if you don't know what you're getting into and or you're new to the fish keeping hobby you definitely want to um to start with fish that have uh filtration and heaters and things like that uh at least to get them to their range at which they are uh recommended to be however let's flip this up so we can actually see some of the fish these guys are the tiniest species of fish that you are going to see in the Americas uh, of freshwater fish and they are incredibly gorgeous when spawning and or protecting their territory. So these guys colony breed and they are called Iliosoma gilberti and that is the Gulf Coast Pygmy Sunfish. Now they're still very wild in that they they are going to want to eat live food. They're very small. I mean, so my lovely painted thumbnail here, uh, in comparison to size, where did he go? If we can just show you, these guys are not even a quarter inch, and they're uh, they're they these are still growing, but a large size male may only grow to three quarters of an inch max. Here is the male of this uh, trio that I purchased from Alyssa Bentley, who you may have seen on the um, Corvus Oskins show uh, or various other places online. She's a rad gal based here in the Puget Sound area as well, just outside of Seattle. She's in Tacoma. Uh, and she is the one who was kind enough to drop these by in the middle of the quarantine. Uh, be able to sterilize the bags they came in and now I'm going to unleash them into these vivariums uh, Riparians that we've been discussing on the channel and So their basic stats of what these wonderful little fish need just to give you a rundown if you're interested is you need a uh, water that is approximately 55 to 75 degrees for them to be happy now in their wild habitat they're found uh this this gulf version is found all the way from the florida panhandle arguably maybe even into louisiana um uh possibly uh alabama mississippi that whole area in there along the gulf coast drainage um there are variations of these sunfish However, the Gilbert eye in particular, uh, we see it in two main river uh, drainages in uh, southwest Florida and then all, or sorry, not southwest, northwest Florida, if you're in the state of Florida, but in the south uh, west, the, in the southeast section of the United States on the west side of Florida. Sorry, that was hard to get it out of my mouth. Uh, and then they are found up into lakes and rivers and flood drainages up in the swamps of Georgia. Now, there is a big enough barrier of uh, that beautiful red Georgia uh, soil, that Georgia clay and earth, 
that uh, separates this population from another population that drains out to the Atlantic rather than the Gulf uh, body of water. And that population is called the Okefenokee. And just like the Okefenokee National Forest and Swamp, they are found in the dun -dun -dun, Okefenokee. And uh, they're a little different. They have uh, an extra set of rays on their fins, the males do, and the females, I believe, have two extra sets on their uh, dorsal fin of little bands. So it's, it's subtle, and their markings are a little less intense, whereas these fish actually color up in electric, beautiful blue. And the males will defend such a small little space. I'm talking... They will turn as blue as my fingernails are right now on quarantine. Something like in between this and a midnight kind of blue. Uh, and then just this metallic sparkle to it uh, that has turquoise notes and just all these other beautiful little subtle colors. And the females will remain mostly mottled gray and translucent. But the male will do this elaborate dance. He will shimmy and shake back and forth. And what we're going to do here, this tank has been operating. Uh, I know there's no filter in here and no heater, but we've had shrimp alive in here, both these Malawa, which are a Caridina species, and we've also had Blue Dream uh, shrimp in here, which are Neo Caridina, similar to cherry shrimp, uh, surviving in here just fine for a total of two years now. And so what we're going to do is we're going to... The fish are smaller than these shrimp, actually, than the adult shrimp in this container. And so they will have a little cave, a little section to hide. But this tank is fully uh, engulfed in this uh, diverse amount of botanical life. So there are little um, little seed shrimp, little um, bacteria, and unfortunately, it's annoying to me, there's planaria, but that is going to break down things. That's going to be food for these guys who really are going to eat wild food. And that's why I said they're not for necessarily beginning uh, fish hobbyists. Uh, if you want something for a beginning level uh, nano fish, I, you know, I would call these micro fish, nano fish, uh, however you want to call it. These are at the very, very small end of the spectrum. And most you would not be able to get away with keeping in a two gallon bowl, you know, um, that that would just be cruel and unusual. However, there are some killifish and some sunfish as well as uh, a few, I would say there's there's probably a few cyprinids and a few of these kind of oddball uh, pup fish and things like that that are found in these extremely remote uh, conditions. I don't mean remote from humans necessarily or from other uh, from other uh, aspects of society, but I mean remote in that. The water body has been cut off by other things, and they have to live in this one body of water. Now, they discovered these around the turn of the century initially, um, and were noted. I'm sure they were known of uh, far before that. But I actually have an old book that was promoted. There's a plenary right now that will be great food for these fish. Um, I actually have an old book called uh, A Boy's Modern Life. And uh, it looks like, did I see another planaria? Uh, and that book is actually full of uh, fish in North America from basically at the time uh, from the Mississippi River headed east. Uh, the west had not been fully explored uh, yet and, and notated in this uh, Boy Scout book at the time. But I remember reading as a kid about these fish and how they made such great pets, whereas a lot of other fish would die in captivity. These could live in, quote-unquote, a goldfish bowl, like you would think a betta could live in. Now, that's that's kind of debatable in that a lot of us know that bettas and goldfish should not be kept in a tiny little bowl. But um, you get the picture. These guys are one that actually... Uh, can be and arguably should be kept in smaller confines. Now, if if you get them too big of confines, they're very uncomfortable. They get very nervous, and uh, they, they're just going to hide anyways under a rock all day. So 
it's kind of interesting that, that they really only need, they say in the wild, they need a cubic foot for a trio, a cubic foot of water, uh, or approximately 1.5 gallons of water. And that is where they will spend the vast majority of their life hanging out. And the male's life is just about coloring up, looking pretty, looking blue, and reflecting light in the morning and at sunset and showing off to his females and then retreating into his little cave, then protecting the area while his clutch, aka his babies, his brood, his eggs, while they all hatch. So um, it's a really cool life cycle. It's very similar to cichlids in the way they care for their young in that um, he'll be watching the eggs and he'll even watch the fry for a short amount of time, uh, which is very cool. So I'm hoping that with the shrimp in here that have been in here uh, a while, that they'll be okay. This water stays between 60 and 70 degrees in the house without being heated at all. It sometimes dip down into the mid to high 50s in the winter since it's by the windowsill but uh it warms up midday uh whether it be from the dishwasher or whatever so uh that's that's all factored in and easy to take care of it's okay that it fluctuates a little and as far as aeration and filtration you can see all this mulm all these roots and things i'm going to snip some of these dead roots out so they don't create uh, nitrogen and ammonia as they break down more but some of these are have been in here for a year or two and they've kind of just built up into this you can see the aqua soil i put in but this is another layer of mulm and shrimp detritus as well as there's a snail in here uh detritus and uh and i suppose the planaria as well and detritus worms and uh bacteria and all sorts of little uh plankton and things and there's quite the diversity of plants so they're really going to enjoy this ecosystem i'll move them to a bigger one if need be if i'm noticing anything wrong or any health problems or them just not responding not eating that kind of thing but let me show you another alternative really quickly before we set these guys free uh well free sorry i put them into a tiny tank uh, where they're going to be happy, and I'll be feeding them live cultures of either baby brine shrimp without their shells on, or we'll be feeding them uh, vinegar eels, all of which uh, recently, in the last few months, I have put together how you can make these kinds of enclosures for them, uh, which plants to kind of choose. You want this kind of tangled nest to disrupt the field of view of these little fish, so they can each kind of have a section and the babies can uh, navigate uh, their own way around the the enclosure. And you can keep them in a 5 or 10 gallon, but seriously, 2.5 gallons of water is just fine for these fish. Uh, and you can see right there, that's the big male. And he is smaller than my thumbnail is across in his length. And he won't get hardly any bigger than that that will be his his uh his life cycle so let's let's set that down for a sec we'll take one more look at another alternative fish that if you guys are wanting these and one you don't live in uh south carolina there's a south carolina species there's an okifinoki species there's a critically endangered alabama species known as the iliosoma alabamii this is the gilbert eye but then there's also the okifinoki version and then there is the uh swanee river um uh version and there arguably are several others as well but those are the main ones that have a a difference in the number of either dorsal or pectoral uh, fin rays, as well as some color and marking differences, and actually behavior and brood size differences, lifespan and, and, and diet differences. But they're not major enough that they need to impact us as hobbyists, other than feeding them live food. But let me show you some fish that you don't necessarily need to feed live feed food to that can also... Uh, thrive in a situation like this but happen to be from across the world in India so if you're done with me now please uh, like and subscribe click the bell if this was useful information if you're interested intrigued if the thumbnail of that beautiful fish 
pulled you in and now you're like how are those going to turn into that beautiful blue once they settle in um it'll all become clear and hopefully we'll start uh, spawning a colony here soon uh with these little guys so uh you can tune out now if that suits you but otherwise i'll show you a couple alternatives that are a little more mainstream uh that you could fill up your basket of fish with and uh, wow your friends with how small of a nano fish you have. So let's go check those out. The rest of you, I will talk to you on the next video and next update with these little guys uh, when they are spawning. Talk to you soon, and uh, let's go on downstairs. Alrighty, guys, we're downstairs now, and we are looking at the Scarlet Baddest. Now, what's really cool, if you've been watching my channel for a while, is you'll know that these fish can change gender. So when a male dies, they will have an alpha male in a colony, and when he passes away, another uh, fish will step forward out of the harem of females. And the cool part about these ones were that you could actually see this male here gaining stripes out of a plain silver existence, and the one below, you can actually still make out the eggs, the viable eggs for that reproduction in the belly while turning into a uh, male or I guess possibly a, a new category, a new third gender of the fish, which is just fascinating. And it's how they survive in tough times. It's how they survive uh, when there is flooding and, you know, they get washed into a drainage basin uh, or, you know, a bunch of uh, fields or little ponds that are literally mud puddles and they will survive in these, you know, rice paddy fields and things like that. Now these guys are living alongside with shrimp also doing just fine. They will eat baby shrimp uh, when they're first born, but as long as you have enough hiding spots, it'll work out. It'll be okay. Some of them never grow to much of any size. You see here some of the females stay very, very small. And then other females become, I suppose you'd say alpha females, and they become the spawners. Now the males will color up with their color just like those other fish upstairs that are from uh, the south, south uh, eastern United States. But these fish here are from Nepal and India. And so I just find it very interesting that there is such a similar little fish. I mean, the, their body, their design, the angle of the fins, the sexual dimorphism, very, very similar in all these fish. Uh, and up here, we have the black and red. This is the one I would uh, recommend even more because these guys actually will uh, tolerate eating uh, flake food and uh, bug bite pellets, things like that. But they wait at this angle pretty much all day, uh, either at the bottom, looking for worms and food dropping. These are males. Or they'll be right at the top of the water, right underneath a, an area where plankton, bugs, uh, little things, little critters we can't even see with our human eyes. See, it's right now it sees something. Uh, where those food items pass by and they will color up and just get incredibly vivid and beautiful here uh, in this kind of uh, purple to maroon color and then they'll have see he just ate something there too uh, and they'll have these blue and black stripes underneath on their pectoral fins as well as a really cool metallic sky blue mohawk type feature uh, above that. The females of this species have a little more flair than the scarlet uh, variety of baddis or the blue baddis, the Dario Dario baddis, which is in the tank below. But these ones, you can see these males, these are the beta males, as in, or beta males, not beta. <laughs> and that means that they stand down. They know they're not the the top of the breeding heap. And so they stand down and they allow the other ones to uh, assert dominance. And usually two will kind of fight it out. So this one and this one generally fight it out. And the one down below has been the winner as of most recently. And he shows that off with the colors. The other ones uh, are 
firmly established in third or fourth place, and so it's not even uh, an area of consideration for the females to spawn with them. In here, though, we have some females. They have gray stripes in this species, the black and red tiger baddis. And these fish get a little bigger, like I was saying, and need some more space. Uh, there's another one right there with no color kind of hiding. Uh, they need a little more space than you would see uh, those gulf sunfish needing or even the scarlet baddis. But... They are full of personality, they are full of turning colors, and you can see their moods, and hunting, and turning colors when they hunt, and camouflaging, and their stripes, and just all sorts of just fascinating stuff. They are a great fish to watch, uh, both the baddest and the pygmy sunfish, the small, nano, micro, teeny tiny sunfish. Uh, and so I'll be feeding them things like Daphnia, vinegar eels, and so forth. Now, they can withstand uh, higher TDS, lower TDS. They're used to rain falling and really, like, deluging things during hurricanes and other things. And in fact, this is when they spawn oftentimes because that is, it would be monsoons in India and Nepal, uh, into Myanmar and Bangladesh uh, and and those regions where you see the various baddest uh, populations. But the, the same with the gulf fish, they have that same cycle of uh, subtropical weather into tropical weather, and then the uh, you know cyclones or typhoons in, in India, and hurricanes, and tornadoes, and all sorts of other tropical storms and things in the southeast of America. But they're a fascinating fish. They all, uh, all both both options. Try out one of the baddest. Aquatic art sells these, and you can get the uh, usually the blue, the scarlet, and the black and red tiger baddest, the one that was up above. Uh, you can get all of them uh, at Aquatic Arts, and I can hook you up with a discount through my channel. Uh, because I've worked with them, I totally approve what they're doing, and they support local breeders like myself and clubs that are in Indiana where they are located, which is not right in my neighborhood, but uh, it's awesome that they do that. And that's one of the ways they're still open during all the uh, shutdowns and things that are going on while we are doing isolation. But I can't tell you how excited I am about playing with, quote-unquote, these fish, and incorporating that vivarium, the, the getting back to basics, using the substrate and the natural flow of gases in having a well-planted and, and uh, integrated tank of life and botanical life where I don't need these sponge filters, where I don't need to do water changes all the time. I can top it off. And that cycle, these fish are so minimal on the on the uh, life cycle and the bio uh, output, the biomass output, that though their ammonia is broken down right away, they actually eat a lot of the little pests, and then light from the sun is really the input more so than even food, and then we'll top it off with, you know, Daphnia, brine shrimp, uh, vinegar eels, micro eels, walther eels, what, or walther worms, whatever it may be that they uh, start to tell me they like as I work with them. So I'm really excited about this, um, and I hope that you guys are as well. If you want to support these projects, these ones are usually ones that cost a little bit extra just because I have to set up a new thing, get aqua soil, and I'm spending time on it and researching and sourcing. But I'd really love to work with more uh, super uh, nano fish and also uh, no Native American uh, species, Native North American species of fish. Uh, it's fascinating. We overlook a lot of really beautiful fish and plants for that matter. And I want to show you and uh, share with you as I learn and what I do already know about these incredible fish and their reproduction and where they fit in into the ecosystem. All right, guys, I will talk to you later. Take care of your critters, the people around you, 
and of course yourself so you can do those first two things and i think if half of us do half of those things uh that we will have a world that is twice as good i will talk to you later have a baddest day and uh we'll talk to you next time bye